welcome to the show and thank you for listening. Well, it's episodes like these that remind me why I do this, why I took the leap and put my heart and soul into doing this podcast. Joey Allen, guitarist for one of my all-time favorite bands, Warrant, is my guest today. And I know they say don't meet your heroes, but I absolutely love meeting my heroes, as I've said before, and talking with them is amazing. And this episode is no exception. Uh, Sometimes you just click with a guest, and I think this is one of those times. Talking with Joey, it felt like chatting with an old friend. You know, we were joking around and laughing, and he just had so many great stories. He tells me about playing in a band uh, with Lars Orwick from Metallica to joining Warrant and having a little accident on stage with Janie Lane. Uh, Hidden images on that first uh, album cover. The story of a present that Tommy Lee gave him on the Motley Crue tour. Why Warrant left the Poison tour. His thoughts on cancel culture. And at the end, he'll tell me about a fun project that the band is working on that I'm excited about and I'm sure all big fans will be as well. So I really hope you guys enjoy this one because I certainly did. Oh my God, this is amazing. Welcome, Joey Allen, guitarist of Warrant. This is like uh, this is like my dream come true to talk to you. It was so cool to talk to Eric, and now I get to talk to you. This is amazing. The ET, you talked to the ET, did you? Yeah, you, I should check that, that uh, episode. That was a lot of fun. But um, now I know all this stuff about you. It's really exciting. So you're from like Orange County area. Is that right? I was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana a long, long time ago. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, grew up in, I grew up in Irvine. Did you grow up, you say you grew up in the same area as the guys from like Lit and Rage Against the Machine and No Doubt? Um, you know, I think the guitar player Tom from No Doubt went to Woodridge High, which was in between Irvine High and University High. I went to University High. And then um, the bass player from Rage, his brother was in my class. So I think he was a few classes behind me mm. at my high school. And then Will Farrell um actor extraordinaire yeah was a, was a year or two behind me at my high school wow do you ever yeah, have well, any interactions with him you know if i did i don't i don't remember sure um, he probably came to i played you know back in those days is when you played the kager parties you know yeah so like instead of going to the dances we'd be setting up the band at the kager parties for after the dance nice so when did you play in this three-piece band with uh, Lars Ulrich from Metallica? I think it was called, was it called White Lightning? Yeah, it wasn't a three-piece. It was actually a five-piece. Oh. It was right when he moved, right when he moved from Denmark to Newport Beach, he lived in a tennis community called Park Newport. Um, he put a, he put an ad out in the recycler and we answered the ad and um, he had a guitar player, a guy named Lloyd Grant, who actually played on, I think hit the lights on that metal massacre record. Oh, okay. So it was me on rhythm guitar, Lloyd on lead guitar, I, a friend of mine, Jeff Brooks on bass. And then another friend of mine, Dave Colton that I grew up with tried, tried to sing at the time. We were all so young, you know, and Lars was too, but he, he was the one that turned me on to a lot of the new wave of British heavy metal and some of the bands that like tigers of Pantang and diamond head. Okay. Stuff like that. And then when he went back to Denmark for a little stint at that time, I asked Lloyd if he wanted to get another drummer. And he said, no, I'm going to stick with Lars. And I said, OK. And that was it. And um, and then look at Lars now. And, you know, he's got a bigger pool than I do. <laughs> nice. So then you join this band. At some point you join up with Eric Turner and Nightmare Nightmare 2. I, there's like a two tally marks. I don't I never understood the name, but. Uh, anyway, that was like the eighties. I feel like everyone had these weird kind of spellings and things. And then you left that band for suspect. And then at one point, this is like, your story kind of takes this detour. You were like a janitor and then you went to school for electric engineering and you worked for Jackson guitars. And then you had been in like 15 or 20 bands before you ended ended up uh, meeting back up with Eric for warrant. Was there other musicians that you worked with that anybody that we'd recognize or no? No, I mean, you've got it pretty right. I mean, I met Eric when I was in the band Nightmare 2. He he wanted to jam in that band, and he came in, and we jammed for a while. Then I left and went to that suspect band. And then there, were, there was another band called Targa that I was in with some with some guys that I still, you know, talk to now and then. And and um, a guy named Johnny Rocks, who's out in um, 
who's out in uh, Vegas and plays around a lot out there. He's a super cool guy. And um, then when I moved to Hollywood, I auditioned for like a number of different bands. And some I got invited to play in and some I didn't. And the ones I got invited to play in, I didn't necessarily care to be in. And Mm. some of the ones that I didn't get invited to play in, I would have liked to, but you know, fate has a way it's work of working itself out. So did any, any of those other ones that you uh, didn't make it, did those bands take off? No, there was one really kind of cool one called forgotten child. They were kind of like ACDC, but a little heavier. Huh? And I just, I think they, and in fact, one of the guys was in the 18 and life video. Oh, um, but that band was fun, but they were just, they were uh, a little more high octane than I cared to be at the time. Okay. So, so yeah. then, Eric brings you back and you join Warrant and obviously the rest is history. Um, you guys are like a big club band, but so tell me about the sunset strip days. Like I, I heard this story last night where Janie was talking about, he was, they were playing, you guys are playing a show at the Roxy and he was laying on the floor and he was holding his mic kind of next to his junk and you jumped on him like Joe, no, accidentally, not on purpose, not trying to hurt him, but you caused an injury to his genitals so bad that he had to be rushed to the hospital. Is that a true story? I don't know. I, I mean, it is a true story. I don't know. <laughs> it might have been embellished a little bit by the rushing to the hospital. Um, well, he said he pulled know, his pants down and there was like blood all over. And he goes, oh, I think I better go to the doctor. He, he he was laying on the ground. He put his mic where his junk is like he was, you know, like he had a hard dick. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I was just joking around and act like a chick and went and like down on it one time. <laughs> but, and And I guess those old mics had a little, not a little, uh, hidden switch. They were a little toggle switch. Oh, and that might've like pinched his stuff. It had to be, it was a little switch. So (laughs) I'm just joking. Um, (laughs) it it just, it was, it was just, it was just uh, bad timing for him. That's crazy. I don't remember if he went to the hospital or not. Okay. Well, he said, obviously it worked out. Okay. He was able to have kids later. So, so for that, yeah, for that year, before you got the deal, what was it like? Cause sometimes I hear people say those are the best times. Like before you make it is like the most fun. Cause it's like the, uh, potential of possibly get getting there. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you're in your early twenties, you're playing a gig, you know, once a month, we played two nights at the country club on a Friday and a Saturday night to 900 or a thousand people sold out. And then we'd go play a Sunday night, either at the Troub, Troubadour, the whiskey, you're the Roxy, the trifecta of gigs every month. And that would make us enough money to put, to make enough flyers and, and Colby boards to go out and do it every month and, and just re, you know, just as much groundwork as possible, you know, and passing out flyers, going to the forum, you know, Van Halen was playing at the forum. We'd go down there with 5,000 flyers and hit as many cars as we could before we got kicked out. And, um, so that was a lot of fun, those trips and just the gigs and all the people you meet on the way up so many different, you know, producers and record company people. And, you know, at the same time though, you got to live a life. So I had a day gig, you know, Mm -hmm. I worked at Jackson Charvel for a few years there. And so even though you'd go out until 10 or night, 10, you know, 10 or 11 at night during the week to flyer, I would get up early and go to my gig. You know, a few of the other guys didn't have gigs after a while, you know, Mm. So it was a lot of fun, man. The clubs were cool. A lot of, a lot of fond memories. Definitely. Who were you, which bands were you guys good friends with at that time? Were you good friends with poison? You guys opened for them on the strip? Yeah. I, when I was, I wasn't in the band when Warren, when Warren opened up with them, but they were very supportive when we were up and coming, when I got into the band and would come out when they were off tour and, and come to our gigs and get up on stage with us. I, I went through a bunch of stuff last year, probably like not, not unlike a lot of people cleaning out old photo bins and stuff like that. And I found a bunch of old pictures of Bobby and Brett, Ricky and, and CC up on stage with us at the country club. And so poison was a band that we were tight with. Um, some of the guys um, I'm trying to think of other bands that we were really, every band was trying so hard that it wasn't, I guess we were cool with the Damals at the time. Um, we actually ended up touring with them. Right. Um, who else did we hang around? There were a lot of bands that opened up. Taz was one of the bands hmm. um, that I was really tight with the guitar player in Taz. And then Kenny, the drummer in Taz, uh, actually 
set in for um, Stephen at the, at the um, Santa Monica Civic when we opened for Ted Nugent before we had a record deal because Stephen had broken his wrist. There's a lot so, of injuries, it sounds like. Yeah, well, when you're young and, and you drink <laughs> a lot, you know, you bump into things. So. <laughs> I guess so. And then, the, the, so the concert that got you guys signed, um, Janie had to play with chicken pox. But you got signed anyways. It makes me wonder, like, did his performance suffer at all? I mean, other than it was kind of cut short. It was a shorter gig. We used to do, you know, an hour and 20 minutes or an hour and 10 or something like that. And I think that was half as long because he was just, he was sick, you know? Yeah. And that's the one where our manager came back and said, okay, Columbia is ready to sign you. And it was just kind of anticlimactic to believe, to believe you know. Really? To think, well, you yeah, because you think you, you you do all these killer gigs with all because we made everything a production. We had staging, we had this guy named Mark Workman who brought in extra lights and sirens and everything, and and um, we made every gig was we tried to make it as big as possible, you know, hmm. in a club setting, and um, and this gig was like okay, we can only play half the gig because Janie's sick, so let's just get in and get out, and so you do that, and then that's the gig you get signed on, you know. That's hilarious. So, uh, we were stoked, but it's like, you know, we didn't, all the extra effort wasn't there. That's funny. You know? yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it paid off. So then you get uh, signed and then you, you're picking a producer and there's a couple guys that you passed on. Um, the, uh, is it Bob Ezrin? Is that his name from Kiss? Who had, uh, yeah, Kiss and, and Pink Floyd. Yeah. Yeah. And then Roy Thomas Baker, who, um, tell me the story. You said you went into his mansion and he had the piano that Bohemian Rhapsody was recorded on. <laughs> That's, That's what crazy. He, said. he lived, he lived off, uh, off of sunset and Kings road. Anybody in Hollywood knows where that's at. And he had a house up there and we went and we met, met with him. And, and, um, I remember the meeting, but I remember the piano and he told us that was the one that, that Freddie played on Bohemian Rhapsody and we were all blown away, but it just didn't, you know, even though I'm a huge queen fan back from the first record, um, it just didn't sink in. You know what I mean? At mm -hmm. the time, it was all about poison and motley and rat and everybody that was on the strip from the strip. Van Halen was a little earlier, but even them. And so that's what our focus was, you know, that mm. whole genre. So picking a guy like Roy Thomas Baker, I mean, the car, he did the cars records, which are brilliant. Yeah, I love those. Um, I, I would, I would uh, jump at a chance to work with Roy Thomas Baker. Definitely nowadays, but back then we were, we were just all young and looking for somebody that, to get the sound we wanted to get right and Bo Hill you picked him because he also he was younger but and also yeah he had done like the rat and all that kind of stuff so it was a little better fit um so then you right. you take that cover which of course I have it right here um you know it's it's designed by a guy named uh Mark Ryden who worked for Disney and he also did Aerosmith's Love in an Elevator is this right. picture is it based on a specific record label executive we could say now because you obviously you're not there anymore no, we were, I remember we were, set, this is my memory of it. At least we were setting, we had two um, apartments in Van Nuys, California. We called it Van Hell because we didn't live in the good part. We couldn't afford it. Um, so Eric and Eric and Janie were in one apartment and Jerry and Steven and I were in another apartment. I actually, my room was under, under the uh, stairs because I was the new guy. So, um, but we, um, we were sitting in one of those apartments talking about what we were going to name our first record. And one of the songs was dirty, rotten, filthy, stinking rich. And, uh, the idea, you know, I, I think I said it, whoever said it, it doesn't matter. Um, but I remember, let's just make it of this, you know, just over the top record executive. That's just fat flowing with money and, and, uh, everybody kind of bought into it. And we went, we told the people at Columbia records about it. And then they, they, um, got Mark, you know, on the line. And, and I guess, uh, the rest is history. I mean, he did a brilliant job. He did Beck's garage, which is killer. Mm -hmm. Um, he's just a great artist. There's a lot of stuff hidden in that, in that, that in that, uh, record. Yeah. So that's what, uh, Eric Turner said. I heard that last night and I was looking, I was looking so close. I'm like, is it really hidden? Where is it? I can't see anything. There's like on the, on the Rolex, instead of Rolex, it says riding oh. one of the dollars. It says, um, I think it says in Elvis, we trust. 
stuff in there you gotta look is there a, where's the naked lady i couldn't find that was the one i was looking for i couldn't find that i i, I could find it if it was in front of me but okay. I, I don't know off the top of oh. my head it's been so long since i'll I have looked. to ch- i'll have to keep looking then so so Ray, anyway, i would love to have the original artwork of that that's oh uh, killer, yeah that's so amazing Mark did. yeah i think is he he's like a real full-on like artist doing like shows like uh art shows and stuff now huh i guess I'd, i i i should look him up and see and try to reach out yeah um, that's, that's, that's cool. very cool. Yeah. So then anyways, you guys do these tours before the record drops, which was smart. But tell me the story about this is kind of a cool story I heard you tell about the first time you heard Down Boys on the radio. So back in the day, my dad worked for the, um, Alpine Car Stereos. He was a he was a vice president at that company. And so everybody in the band that had a car had had a nice Alpine stereo, um, courtesy of my father and. I remember that I'd gotten the tape of it, of the first record. And as I drive around in my car, I'd be listening to here and there, you know, back in the day, because I was proud of it and happy. And, and I remember turning my car on one time and down boys was on and I didn't want to, I didn't I'm like, I've heard this too much. I'm done. And I went to eject it and I couldn't eject it because it was on the radio. And that's the first time <laughs> I heard, heard our song on the radio. That is so, so I cool. Did, I, I didn't want to hear it, but. <laughs> had no choice except for to turn it off so then i wanted to listen to what they would say after the song and it's pretty cool yeah that is awesome and then you guys you know you've done the shows with uh paul stanley and eddie money and stuff but then you did a tour with the crew motley crew and you know they're started out sober but as the tour went on they became less sober i heard this story i don't know if this is even true that you have to confirm this or or deny it, but um, after you guys heard that you, I think I don't know if it was Heaven hit number one or two or something. There was a big landmark. Your record hit number one or went platinum. That you trashed your dressing room, and Tommy Lee was pissed, so he delivered a plate of shit to you guys. Is that a true story? True, true story. One hundred and ten percent true. <laughs> we were on tour. Wow. <laughs> we were fired up. We had been on tour. I mean, I think that first record we toured like two hundred and eighty plus shows. Eric's got the exact number. He's, he keeps all that stuff, I think. But um, so we're on tour with the crew. We're having a great time. They were still sober. They didn't get. They didn't start to waver until the end of the end of our leg of that tour. Okay. Um, I was with Tommy when when he started to do that. We were out at a club having some fun one night. But anyways, so you were um, a bad influence, is what you're saying? Hey, man. He asked. <laughs> I just, okay. I just comply. Hey, when the headliner asks for something, what do you? Yeah. Do? So it was his idea to go out to the bars and you're like, okay, twist my arm. I'll go party with yeah. Tommy Lee. It was a la- it was a ladies establishment or a gentleman's establishment, so to speak. Okay. How's that? Yeah. So in Atlanta, but anyways, back to the, sh- the plate, the shit on the plate. <laughs> so at one gig, we, you know, you get out on the road, you miss home. You just, you're fucking hung over drunk, whatever. And we just thrashed our, our tour, you know, our, our dressing room in the arena. And, and that means just made a mess. You know, we didn't burn anything. We didn't break anything. I don't think we might've broken something, but nothing, no windows or anything, maybe some furniture. And um, the next day we walked into our dressing room and there was nothing like no furniture, no catering, nothing, no towels, no nothing, just a, just a room, like four walls. And um, about five minutes go by and, and knock on the door and we answer it. And it's Tommy with a, with a plate of shit. And he just goes, I heard you guys, you know, didn't get any catering today. So I thought I'd bring this up for you. <laughs> and I think they might have got somebody got tagged with, you know, it was probably grand to clean up the room or something. Yeah. So maybe they got charged with it or oh. I'm sure they charged us back. But it was just their way of saying, keep your keep your shit together, so to speak, or it'll end up on a plate. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So then yeah. the, the next, you guys get pulled off that tour to work on cherry pie. Is it true? What, one of the working titles for that record was vertical smile. I remember that one. I remember quality. You can taste. I don't remember. Janie talked about having it be called uncle Tom's cabin. I don't remember yeah. that as much as quality. You can taste. Okay. Um, but I remember we were done recording and then Jerry and I took off for a um, golf celebrity golf tournament with um, with a guy named Gary Morris. He's a country artist and he's also been on, on, on Broadway and played the, you know, and Les Mis, he was, he was Jean Paul. He's super great singer, 
same manager. So he's a really good friend. We went and played this celebrity golf tournament for some charity in Denver. And we got literally called back to, um, there goes the gardener. Oh. We got called back uh, to record cherry pie literally a day or two later. Yeah. Well, and, and you had an interesting take on that. Cause you know, obviously everyone has heard Janie say like, Oh, I didn't, you know, I hated that song and I hated being the cherry pie guy. But you, you said that uh, at the time you don't remember him complaining about it too much because you guys were like killing it. So like, I don't think he was complaining at that point. Well, he wrote it. Um, and we recorded it and we all liked it. It was catchy. He got, he was single. He got to look through a book of models to pick a girl to be in the video. Um, I don't think he was complaining much about any of that. Right. You know? And the success of that record and that tour, you know, being able to go from opening for poison to headlining our own arenas, you know, kind of speaks for itself back in the day. So I get it. I mean, his, his catalogs way deeper than that song. Sure. And, and there's, there's songs I appreciate, you know, listening to a lot more than that song, but to be bummed about it is, is kind of a, I, I it's, it's disturbing to me because you should be proud of what, of your work, you know? Yeah. And I think generally he was, he was probably just bummed that, you know, he didn't get the recognition he thought he should get as a songwriter. Yeah. For the other stuff, but that cherry pie. So, I, kn I knew that it had CC DeVille did the solo, but I didn't know this at the beginning, that scream that's why is that D Snyder? That's like a, that's lifted from why did the Bo Hill put that scream from D Snyder on there? That's not D Snyder. What the it's one not? that goes dirty, rotten, filthy stuff at the rich. very beginning before you guys say dirty, it goes, you know, the, ah, like that scream. Uh, I didn't, I don't think that's D Snyder. That's what somebody said. So maybe that's not true then. I haven't heard that one. Okay. Well, Rolling Stone didn't like the Cherry Pie music video. They called it the most tasteless video of 1990. It reminds me of, <laughs> I love that. It reminds me of that scene in Spinal Tap where they call the, they say the album cover is sexist and the musician's like, well, what's wrong with being sexy? And they're like, no, yeah. sexist. But are you yeah. worried about that now with this whole like Me Too and everybody being going back and finding stuff to cancel? Are you worried that someone's going to start a cancel campaign against Warrant or the album or the video? You know, what's what's amazing back then is 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 Rolling Stones very choosy about what they do and what they think is art and their little rock and roll Hall of Fame club and all that bullshit. And to have them not like something is like a badge of honor for me because I'm not a big fan of Rolling Stone. I never was. I was more of a circus cream guy. You know, I like those magazines. So anyways, thinking that that song is <clears throat> sexist, the video misogynistic in any way it was tongue in cheek it was supposed to it was supposed to arouse the senses and get you to think either if you're a young man about some you know hot girl in a video take it from there or if you are a liberal tipper gore type of person that might piss you off in today's cancer you know um whatever you want to call it, uh, environments, you know, they can think whatever they want. I really don't care. I don't subscribe to it. I'm a real guy that works hard and takes care of my family and my friends. And, and that whole vibe is just disturbing to me, to be honest with you. Yeah. I loved it as a kid. And I, I love the, uh, the, the last track, the tip, the ode to Tipper Gore, where you guys just swear for like an entire minute. It's like this compilation of fuck, fuck, fuck. And I, I thought it was great. I love that kind of stuff, but yeah, it is interesting to see. I don't know if times it feel like stuff cyclical though. Maybe it's going to shift back. I hope. Cause I loved all the, the, that kind of stuff when I was a kid and I still, I still enjoy it now. Well, it is what it is, man. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Janie ended up marrying the girl and, and, mm -hmm. and having a beautiful daughter together. And, and it's, it's, um, so, I mean, like, like you said, how more sexy is that? Right. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's just weird what people go after nowadays. And I think that people should just, if everybody in the United States got a job and worked for a living, it'd be a much better place. Well, and don't Man. you think that if people created their own, like you created this, I mean, you're part of a, you know, you didn't create the whole thing by yourself, but you're part of this band. You're having creative control in, you know, rather than everyone just being an employee, don't you think more people should create their own businesses or things like that and have their own projects or their own podcasts like me? 
I think the only thing we're, we're entitled to in, in the United States of America, we're not really not entitled to anything, but if you get an opportunity, what you make of it is your own, you know, and some people take opportunities and run with them and some people sleep in. And, you know, I'm the kind of guy that gets up at 4.30, 5 a.m. in the morning and I work my ass off all day. I've got a day gig. When I tour with Warrant, I work 70, 80 hours a week. So to have some punter tell me what they think about my video and want to, want to, you know, the pound me too movement or any of that, I have no, I have no, no reasonable uh, reason to give a, give a shit. You know, (laughs) I've got a daughter, she's 30, she's educated, she takes care of herself. And I think we've got to be responsible as human beings. I don't think anybody in Warrant is misogynistic. All of us have wives. Um, and, and some of, you know, I've got a daughter, like I said, so it's just, people just subscribe to weird things and they go down these rabbit holes and it's really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, so back to that time, um, after, or the, when the, yeah, the album comes out and then you guys tour with poison on the flesh and blood tour. What happened on that tour? Did did you get cut short? I I thought I heard somebody say something. There was a blowout with poison. <clears throat> we were having a great time. They were having a great time. I think they were a little pissed that, you know, sometimes the, when the setup would happen in a bigger place, they put a bunch of subs on the floor and Janie would run out on the subs and do it. And we would use the stage that was there. Okay. Um, and I think, I think that that pissed somebody off in poison. So what they did was they put up at one gig, these big eight by four, um plywood whatever you want to call them just you couldn't get on the subs right Hmm. so they were like big uh barriers right okay and and um we knew it before we went on we were kind of pissed like why would they do that we've got like two and a half three weeks left of the tour and so janie went out there being himself and ripped down those barriers and ran out on the subs like he normally did (laughs) And we kind of, it kind of pissed us off. We're like, why would you do that? You yeah, know, you guys have like ten times as many lights, ten times as much stage room, pyro. Your drum set goes up and down. All we have is these two set carts, and about a quarter of the stage room, and part of it's these two holes up front that if you don't watch what you're doing, you're gonna fall in. And so when we got done with that gig, and it was in Montana, and it was snowing, um, we came off stage, and Scotty Ross, who was Poison's tour manager apologized and said i'm sorry but you guys are fired from the tour and there was a line of yellow jacket security guy go not going to our dressing room but going out the back door out into the snow we had to walk into our tour bus like drenched damn and 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 we were pissed we're like that's not cool and we said okay you know what we got it fuck it we're out you know and then we went back to our hotel room our hotel we we had a few cocktails they came by after their show to talk about it. And we just said, there's nothing to talk about. You know, Mm -hmm. that was a long, long, long time ago. Whoever in the band did it. I don't care. I'm I'm friends with all those guys. We Hmm. are all friends with them. It's kind of funny to talk about it now. Okay. Well, that's cool. That's that's, that's my perspective, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's got a different story about what really went down, but that's what I remember. Yeah. That was like 30 years ago. So, but anyway, so then you guys go do this other tour the blood, sweat, and beers tour. I've heard nothing but amazing stories about this. That sounds like so much fun. I've heard stories from Eric, PJ, Bill, uh, Mark. I mean, everybody. So do you have a memory uh, or story from this tour that stands out? Because, I, I mean, it just sounds like there's so many. <laughs> you know, I. You know what's funny is I talked to Steve Brown from Trickster. We see each other out on gigs, or and he's a dear friend, and he told me that one time, Cause there was, we had a 40 by 60 stage, right? Yeah. So there were two dressing rooms. There was a dressing room underneath stage left and a dressing room underneath stage right. And stage right was Eric and Jerry and Steven and stage left was Janie and I. And I remember Steve Brown would, cause it was under the stage. So you come in from the back and go up and under to get to these things. And I remember Steve Brown told me that he came into the dressing room about two minutes before he went on one time. And I was on the ground with my guitar strapped on trying to sleep because I hadn't gone to sleep. And then 
you know, he said, Hey, Hey. And then my tech came in and grabbed my hand and pulled me up and out on stage. I went. So that's a, that's a, a bit of a memory that I don't remember, but Steve <laughs> told me about. It. Yeah. So it must've been pretty crazy. You guys were so, you said something like you were so busy at that point. Um, it, cause it's a height of success for that band, for the band. And you weren't really able to reflect and enjoy it as much. Cause you're just, you're so busy working all the time. Yeah. I mean, you just work, 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 and you don't, you know, you don't really have a, you're in a different city every day. You don't have a, um, a barometer of where you're at or what day of the week it is. You just go to work as much as you can, you know? Mm -hmm. So wow, a lot of work. That's crazy. So then in the next record, dog eat dog, um, one of my favorites and, uh, Janie wrote in the liner notes, this album was dedicated to you and you're one of the most underrated guitarists in rock today. Do you agree with that <laughs> statement? No. <laughs> there, <laughs> there's a reason why he wrote that. Um, when we were doing that record, I was working really, really, really hard on my playing. I was taking lessons from a few different guys and just working hard because I just wanted to really step out and do as much as I could as, as a lead guitar player. And, um, and we were working with Michael Wagner and he was, you know, had worked with Nuno and worked with Scotty and Dave and, and, uh, and Skid Row. And yeah. so I just wanted to step up. So I did. And because I was working so hard, I'm like, you know what? I want some more of the publishing, you know, mm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on my guitar parts, all this stuff. And so I hit my manager up and I'm like, Hey, I, it's funny that I couldn't just go to Lane and say, Hey man, I'm working my ass off. Give me a few more points, you know? Um, but I went to our manager, our manager went to Janie, Janie, you know, it was like this, this, uh, tennis match, but he, I think he put that on there to appease me and for all the hard work I made, you know, put forth on that record. So super, super nice of him. Did um, he give you more points too? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, but it was a great, it was, that was probably the best time for Warrant, I think, because we were fresh off two world tours. We were playing really good as a band. We were really gelling. And the, the you know, for me, the guy that likes the heavier stuff in the band, that was heavier, you know? Yeah. And My, Michael Wagner was a totally different producer than Bo Hill. You could hear the guitars, you know, and we really took a lot more time on guitars on that record than, than the prior two. So it was a lot of fun for me. Yeah. So Janie specifically wanted to write kind of a harder and darker record because he didn't want the band to be seen as a pop metal band. But um, I heard you talking about this song. I had never heard about this song, pop music. And I went out and I found oh. it on YouTube. Dude, this is such a catchy, fun song. I think if, if pe fans are of the first two records would love this. I, it was like getting a Christmas present for me listening to this yesterday, but you didn't like it. In fact, you sabotaged it so that it wouldn't go on the record. How did you do that? What did you, how did you sabotage the guitar tracks? Well, it wasn't really a sabotage, but we, you know, you have like 14 or 15 songs you want to record. Yeah. And that was one of them. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're sitting there doing rhythm tracks, um, you know, which are rather easy you do two or three tracks and, and onto the next song. And I remember coming to that song and it's setting with all those other songs, the machine gun, hole in my wall, bitter pill, all these just heavy, heavy, heavy songs and pop music stuck out like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we were going to make cherry pie version two, that would have been great, but it would have had to be a less dark record than, you know, all the other songs like, you know, Andy Warhol was right. And all those tunes on that record were so heavy and dark and pop music just didn't make it. So we basically did the rhythm tracks kind of haphazardly. And when Janie came in to listen, we just had a, a come to Jesus about the song and said, Hey man, it just doesn't fit. You know, mm -hmm. in hindsight, would it have been great to be on that record? I, I don't think so because it didn't fit. But could have um, been on like a soundtrack or like an extra bonus track is on the, on the best of greatest hits or something. Cause there, there, you know, he wrote a lot of really, really great tunes, catchy tunes. And, and that was one of them. It would be great to re-record that if he was still around with him. Um, but otherwise, you know, the version you heard, I think is probably the demo version and uh, that's it. So. It's pretty good. Yeah. 
But so the record label, um, they wanted Hole in My Wall as the first single, but Janie pushed for Machine Gun. Did they not try to go in and say, hey, you need to make another Cherry Pie type of song? Do you think, did they just kind of give up on the band at that point because the music scene changed or did they just trust him because he had had so many hits? I don't know what their thinking was. You'd have to have an interview with Donnie Einer. Oh, okay. Ron, Ro- Ron Overman, who was one of the guys that signed us along with a guy named... Um, Brett, I'm forgetting his last name. Oh, he's going to kill me. Um, I'll remember it in a minute. But okay. anyways, those guys just made, those guys made decisions as executives on what they were going to do, you know, with the record and what they were going to push. They're the ones who had to have the guys, all the team of promotion go out and, and, and work the songs. You know, mm-hmm. I thought hole in my wall would have been great because we could have done the whole voyeurism thing and, Think about the video would have been great. Mm-hmm. It would have been a great, you know, backup to, to Uncle Tom's cabin and or, um, you know, something that we did that was a little heavier. But they, we did machine gun about a tattoo gun and it was pretty cool. That's pretty loud. Is that is that bugging you? Yeah, it's kind of loud. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you can stop, if you can do something about it, but if not, no big deal. He's going to he's going to stop in a minute. OK. Yeah. So with them at song machine gun, like. You know, if Janie, when Janie did it live, he would say, like, instead of saying, love your little baby like a m- m- machine gun, he'd say, eat your little pussy like a m- 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 machine gun. Was that the original lyric and then change it for the record? Or is that something he just came up with one night? I'm sure that was something he just did off the cuff. Okay. I mean, <laughs> it sounds perfect. I mean, eat it, your pussy or fuck, 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 fuck you like a little. Whatever. Oh, okay. He did some other he ones just, too. He was just, it, it was probably out of boredom, you know? Yeah. Is there a song from either um, Dog Eat Dog or any of the first three albums that you thought maybe should have been bigger? Like something that you thought this is going to be a big hit, but um, it just didn't happen or something that maybe didn't even release. Like because like Stronger Now, I think you said that he had had that song since uh, uh, before he put it out on Ultraphobic. And Thin Disguise is another one that that stands out to me as like, that's a pretty good song, too. And, And those were never even released. Yeah, Thin Disguise kind of sounds like a cheap trick riff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I don't know if he borrowed it from them. I mean, we're all fans of cheap trick. So, um, I, you know, I don't really, I don't think that way. To me, it's more of a collection, more like a book. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like saying, hey, what's your favorite chapter? You know, and it's like, it's, it's more of a, you know, put the needle down. Let's decide one, flip it over, let's decide two, or put the CD in and listen to the whole thing straight through. And it's supposed to just take you to a place as a listener and leave you somewhere at the end, right? Uh-huh. And you can think about what the song means, what the lyric content means. Um, so to me, I never really took it in that context of, oh, this would have been a better song for a single or this or that. I, I just, when I was told this is what the single is going to be and you have to be at radio on these times on tour i'd get up and be there you know and and that's more was was my angle of how to deal with you know what singles were released i would just once they picked it i would go out and support it Mm -hmm. i heard this story i don't know if you were even in the band at this point but they uh, weren't cut a demo song it was kind of during the grunge era and you guys had the manager like present it to a record label without the artist's name on it. And the, and the record label was like, oh, this song is amazing. And then you, they said it was Warrant. And then they're like, oh, we don't want anything to do with it. Like, it was almost like this like discrimination. Do you know what? Do you heard that story? I haven't. I, somebody else told me. So I've heard it one time. Before, okay. But it was, I wasn't when I was in the band. Yeah. So then, yeah, because you left. And then um, you, were, you said that you were kind of partying too hard at this point, And you kind of just needed a break. Is that part of it? Yeah, I I was going through a divorce. We were getting multiple lawsuits for all different kinds of things. And I just had enough. One day I woke up and uh, we were supposed to have a meeting. We had been dropped by Columbia. We we're having a meeting, get another deal. And we were struggling to, you know, pay bills at that time. And, and um, I just bailed, you know, and it wasn't because of any one person in the band. You know, sometimes I look back and I say, I couldn't really rely on Janie because he never, you know, he couldn't get up out of bed to make a meeting at noon, but it's not really fair to him to say that I was, I was in a, in a not so um, great place in life. And I think that, um, 
you know, self perseverance kind of kicked in and I did what I had to do. You know, I, I left and I probably fumbled around for another year. And then once I got out of that, that haze, I, I got my focus back and, you know, I went back to school, um, which was strange for me because the band was still going and playing and making records. And, and it was strange for me to be in a, you know, in a classroom with a bunch of it geeks you know, getting Microsoft certified, which is what I did. But in, right. in hindsight, that's proven to be really, really good for my career and what I do, you know, as a day gig now and and just overall, you know, having some chops on on um, in business and things like that. It's really, yeah, it's really helped me out. I remember reading in Metal Edge that you were going to go to law school. Was that something that an idea that you tossed around? thinking about it until I found out you had to read a lot. I'm not, I'm not a big reader. <laughs> it reminds me of that scene in um, uh, Doc Hollywood with Michael J. Fox when he's the guy's like, you know, I was going to be a doctor. It's just all that science that I didn't want to do. <laughs> it's kind of like that. I mean, yeah. um, I've, I've read my fair share of technical manuals for Microsoft. Trust yeah. me. Okay. And, and, you know, getting certified, you know, you have to know what you're doing. And, um, but it's, um, I just didn't want to make the commitment to be a lawyer. I was working with so many lawyers. I'm like, wow, these guys are making all this money. I should just do that. So I was thinking mm -hmm. about it, but I didn't go that route. I went, I went the IT route instead. And why? And you didn't, um, you didn't do anything. You wanted, didn't want to do anything in the music business, like be a guitar teacher, or open up a guitar store, or manage bands or produce bands. Did you just want a break from the business entirely? I needed a, a break from the business just for self perseverance to be honest with you i mean i had a yeah. young daughter i had to you know just get responsible for myself and and be able to make income that i could support my young daughter as well as i could financially and and um, emotionally and just be there as a father so so i kind of made that that decision on my own and it worked out well for me in the long run i have a great relationship with my daughter and my ex-wife um and my present wife and my present son. Um, so it, it's worked out well for me. And it's and like I said, it's really helped me out in, in today's business world as well. For sure. So, but I know that you, and I don't know if these are two separate things, but you played music uh, with some guys in Orange County, some power uh, punk stuff. And then you also had done a demo in Texas. You got some money from MCA and you said there was two really good songs on this demo, but nothing happened with that. Um, will that ever be released or, or what was this? You know, I love music to, to death. I love Warrant. Um, I, I'm, I'm the type of guy, I live in Southern California. It's expensive to live here. I have to generate income and music. It's really, really, it got really increasingly more difficult mm. to generate income um, as a musician. And a lot of my peers know that it's a tough, it's a tough life. It's a tough road. A lot of guys will forfeit the money for the art and I'm just not, not necessarily one of those guys, hmm. you know, I've got a family to feed um, and I want to take care of my family and I want to, I want to entertain my friends when I can. And, and so I took a different path with business instead of keep on, keep on going. Now there was a point where as a guitar player, I got, I got better and better and better. It was during the doggy dog record and after when we toured and then um, when I got out of the band, I just was kind of burnt out. I knew, you know, it went, it went like this and then it went, woo, like that. And I jumped up before it hit rock bottom and with a parachute and, um, I might do something, you know, I've talked about it with a few friends of mine that are great players, different drummers, because I'm, you know, working for Pearl, Pearl drums. I, I there's uh -huh. a lot of drummers I know that are amazing. A lot of amazing bass players, singers, Maybe one of these days, if I take the time, but it's just such a time commitment to do a record for me, do something that would be good. Sure. That it's not, it's not high on my radar. Let's just put it that way. But Absolutely. maybe someday when things slow down a little bit more, I'll do one, you know, mm -hmm. one and done. Yeah. So you rejoined the band. Uh, so uh, you had like a 10 year hiatus, but then yeah, 2004, you rejoined the band with Eric and you guys are, uh, Chugging along with uh, Jamie St. James from Black and Blue. I like that. Um, is it not Bourbon County Line? That's the name of the uh, Born Again was the name of the record that you guys did with that. And I think I saw you guys on that tour. Um, and then 2008, there was a there was an attempt to get back with Janie Lane. Tell that story. You guys were 
were doing a, a gig for Adam <laughs> Carolla or like a, you were the house band or something. At Gazzari's, which was now called the Key Club at the time, Adam Carolla was on the local radio station, and it was Danny Bonaducci from the Partridge family. It was his divorce party. And Adam and, and the band are friends, and Adam hired us with Danny as the house band for the divorce party. And um, so we were just, all we were supposed to do was play down boys in and out of every break. So we just stood there like down boys like a bazillion times, huh. but we were down in the dressing room in between some breaks. And um, I think um, Dave Navarro came in and said to Eric, you know, your singer's up in the audience and, and, and Janie go, or Eric goes, no, our singer's right here. It was Jamie. And he goes, no, you know, Janie Lane. And he looks at Dave Navarro and he goes, Janie Lane ain't our singer. I remember something like that, huh. but Eric kind of barked at Dave. It was funny. Dave's a little tiny guy. Anyways, <laughs> he's, he's a nice guy. I, yeah. don't, I don't know him well, but he, he was, he was very nice to us. And that's cool. And so I guess Lane was at that gig and saw it. And then he reached out to Eric and said, I want to get back in my, in my band, um, which it was never his band. It was our band. And maybe that's why there were so many struggles with us and him, you know, because of just the way of thinking, but we, we um, sat down and buried the hatchet on all the emotional crap and the legal crap with him and supported his sobriety in every way we could. And, and we got up, you know, and, and, and uh, did the best we could for a reunion tour, but it just wasn't, wasn't meant to be. Well, again, yeah, I don't think people, cause you know, I see these, like, I, you know, I got a YouTube comment on the interview with Eric, like, why didn't they try to help Janie? And I was like, and I heard you say that that reunion tour you guys got uh, Janie Lane a sober coach for five hundred dollars a day. You took all the booze out of the backstage. You didn't let anyone backstage with booze. I mean, I don't know what more you can do to try to help the guy, and he just couldn't true, handle true, it. True, true, true. Yeah. yeah, Chuck Randolph, who is Allison Chain's tour manager, was nice guy. Um, we we did AA meetings backstage for Janie. I mean, there's guys in this band that are responsible adults that if they want an adult beverage, they'll take one. It's they're not gonna sure. miss an air gig or screw anything up um but he he just we you know understood the really really you know um brutal truth of of his alcoholism and tried to support it as best as we could and it, it included all those things you talked about and more mm -hmm. um and then at one point he would just he got he got hammered and jerry just woke up one day and came to us and said, I don't want him to die out on the road under our watch. And that was as easy as it was, you know, go home, get healthy. We'll see what we're going to do moving forward. And that's how we left it. And, um, you know, it was unfortunate that it ended that way when it did, but it was more of the long lines of, we didn't want him. Like if it was being on the road was a trigger for him. Uh -huh. Yeah. We didn't want to be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. well, it's not worth any money to watch a friend of yours die because you need to make a buck or want to get up on stage. That's not what it's about. Um, and so for anybody out there to comment about what we did or didn't do for Janie during, during those times, or for anybody to comment about, you know, the fact that, that none of us went to the wake they had at a bar. So a guy dies of ethanol poisoning and they have a wake at a bar and you're supposed to think that's, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, one of the most tasteless things you could ever do. And, and um, you know, it's none of anybody's business how you grieve the loss of a friend or a brother or a sister or a parent or anything. And um, he's missed. Uh, we love him like a brother. It sucks horribly. Every time the, the, uh, the anniversary rolls around, it, you know, I think about him dearly. Every night I go on stage, I give a nod to him my own special way. Kind of like, I don't know if you remember the Carol Burnett thing where she used to yeah. pull her ear to let her mom know she was okay. I kind of do, I don't pull my ear. But <laughs> I do something every, every night that's the same every night. And it's, it's huh. just, I'm kind of talking to him for a minute, you know? That's so, cool. Yeah. And you actually reached out to him a few months before he passed and you tried to have lunch with him and you just, you didn't hear back. Did. Yeah, Mike Fasano called me and said, hey, man, let's go have lunch with Janie. And I called him and left a message on his recorder. And 
or cell phone or whatever it was. And yeah. Just told him, Hey dude, I love you. You know, no hard feelings about anything. Let's just go grab a bite with Mike. And, um, I don't know if he didn't get it or didn't want to go out or whatever, but he didn't get back to me. And then he died shortly after then. So it's, it's just tragic. I feel bad for his kids, you know, and his family and, um, you know, it's just a horrible thing. Yeah. I wish we could have an answer for like what, ha- like I just, you know, a cure for this issue. Cause there's too many amazing musicians out there dying. I, I hate it. I hate to see that with so much talent wasted. It's sad to see. It is absolutely horrific for the yeah. people that, that can't get out of it. You know, it be it, be it alcohol or drugs or prescription drugs or whatever's out there. It's, it's horrible. So yeah. It's a real, it's a real problem. Yeah. But you, you know, life goes on and we have to soldier on and then you guys have Robert Mason in the band. Now he's fantastic. You guys have made two great records, rockaholic. And then uh, the latest one, louder, harder, harder and faster. Um, you said that like with the louder, harder, faster, this was interesting. There was a, there was actually some drama making that because it was people like, I want my song in the record. No, I want my song. And so who makes the final call with that? Do you leave it to Jeff Pilson, the producer, or do you put it to a vote or how does that work? It's very uh, political, you know, where Warrant, you'll never hear Warrant talk about politics. It's none of anybody's business, what we all think. It's about music. And when it comes time to write and record music, people, there are, there are favors done and things happen. I'll work on your song. Let's work together. You know, you, we all put riffs or or rhythms or whatever into a big you know there's a joey folder there's a jerry folder there's a eric folder a robert folder a steven folder and to be honest with you some of these guys work harder than the others i don't i don't work necessarily real hard at writing because i need to work with somebody and unless somebody's really going to sit down with me and get into it it's i'm not motivated to to go through that whole process alone. Mm -hmm. Um, So at the end of the day, when all the songs are there, you put them in a big bowl and you vote on them. Okay. So it's, it's just like going to the polls and voting for president. So it is a vote. Okay, cool. There's a vote. And that's fair. And you just say, okay, this one got five votes, you know, so there's maybe eight out of 12 that get five votes. And then the last three or four that make a record, you know, just, it's just a voting process. It's sure. Easy. Yeah. And then you guys made the video for louder, harder, faster. It was actually filmed here. I'm in Arizona. It's just filmed oh, like yeah. 30 miles North of me in cave Creek. Is there going to be another yep. video filmed in Arizona? And if so, can I have a cameo in it? <laughs> that was Robert Mason. He lives in cave Creek where we recorded the, the film, that video. So now they're, now they're blowing next door. <laughs> So I'll it. give a mil- I'll give a million dollars to the first guy that makes a silent blower. Yeah, okay. right. That would be an amazing invention for sure. Um, yeah, we did that video um, and in Robert's backyard. So I think Eric and I drove out. I went and picked him up at his house when he lived out here in California. And we just jammed out to Arizona. It was like a six hour drive and did the video and then got in the car and went home. Hmm. So I don't think we'll do another video for that record. If we did, I'd love to do like like um, the second tune on that Devils Devils Dance or Dance Devils Dance would be great, yeah. Yeah, or like a new. If I'm saying if you had like a new record, but you actually love the heavier songs, and I heard that are you in charge of picking the set list? So that's also if I want to hear a specific Warrant song, I could tell you to to put it in the set list. I write the set list. Yeah, I'm the guy. Yeah, if you don't like it. The one, you can bitch at me. No, you you do a great job, but I, it'd be cool to have another one of like those heavier songs from Dog Eat Dog, like Inside Out. I know you guys used to play that even before it was uh, recorded, right? Absolutely. That we opened the Blood, Sweat, and Beers tour with that song. Yeah, um, that's kind of our our ode to Judas Priest, so to speak. Um, I, you know, I'd lo- we played different songs on the road of, of off of doggy dog. Like we played bonfire. Hmm. Um, I think we've played, uh, Oh, trying to think of some other ones. Hole on my wall, machine gun bonfire, maybe quicksand, hmm. maybe, but, um, never all yeah, my bridges are burning. Have you ever played that yes, one? We played that one. That's, oh, the one, not that's what I was going to say. That, that'd be a cool one. Yeah. 
we played that one back in the day, I think, with Saint. Okay. So, um, yeah, that was a great record to make. Fun, fun tunes. Yeah, so, and you have a lot of riffs in your catalog. So, I mean, is there any talk of you guys working on a new uh, Warrant record? You know, when this whole pandemic started, some guy said, why don't we do something live on the internet? Why don't we do this or that? And that was squashed. Everybody's like, why don't we just go away for a while? We haven't, <laughs> you know, we've been touring for so long. Yeah. And um, let's just go away. So that was the consensus. And then I think about six months into the pandemic, we had a meeting and I said, hey, is anybody interested in starting to write for a new record and it was like nope and that okay. was it all right you know, now i don't know what eric's done i don't know what jerry's done i don't know what robert's done i know robert did an in machine record right with george and jeff which is great so i i would imagine we've probably got one left in us you know okay um, but we'll see i mean there's no immediate plans for that right now the immediate plans are to to get the back out the band back out on the road. And I think in, in June, we're going to be doing that this year. So we're fired up. Yeah. I saw that. And you guys have this show. I want to try to make it in Minnesota with like a bunch of, it was like some Sebastian Bach and lit and uh, LA guns. And it's got like a huge uh, two day festival kind of thing. Yeah. That's at Hinkley, the rocktober fest, I think. Yeah. So, I rocktember. Think our first gig back is like winger and docking and Lita Ford and, um, Jack Russell and a bunch of the, you know, a bunch of guys like that. So there's a bunch of dates like that. We're doing a bunch, bunch with Skid Row. Um, it's kind of East, East, you know, versus West, but we're such good friends. It's just, yeah. So are you, you're just friends with all these guys. Cause you guys have done so many shows together over the years, right? At this point of the career, it's, it's, um, you know, with, with most every band we play with, we're tight. You know, we laugh, we see each other in the hallways, dressing rooms share a beer, go out to dinner or something on a night off. And and you just got to, you know, we're all fortunate to be still doing this and doing what we love to do and being able to play the songs that, that we like to play. So, you know, it's, it's real easy when you see somebody on the road that, you know, it's kind of like a high school reunion, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I, I think we covered almost any, everything unless there's something I missed, but all right. Here's your chance. Yeah, I think we got it all. No, this was amazing. So I do like to end awesome. each episode with a charity. Is there a charity that you work with or that you want to promote real quick? You know, um, anything to do with children. Um, St. Jude's. Okay. Definitely um, breast cancer for women. Um, even though the cancel culture and Me Too movement would probably, you know, <laughs> find a way to, to spend that as well. Um, just... <laughs> just uh, you know I'm, I'm heavy on children i think i think um, i'm a strong believer that as an adult you, you should be a responsible adult be responsible for yourself and run your own life the way you want to run it and be kind to one another but i think that kids you know being a father and, and being responsible for a young son right now kids really need direction and um sick kids need help so saint jude's definitely one of them for sure that, that i i'm into um and just any, anything, you know, autism for, for, for kids and adults. Um, so yeah, I mean, just go out there and participate. If you get a, if you get an opportunity, we do a bunch of different stuff through the year, giveaways, you know, anytime we're asked to participate in something like that, we, we step up if we, if we can. So yeah, giving back is a big part of getting, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I prefer to give more than I do prefer to get. Yeah. Well, you had some interesting life advice. Um, you know, if you do, if you do something that you love, the money will come. And I've heard that from a lot of people. So, but it, I mean, it has to be something that it does generate money though. Right. If you want to live, you know, I mean, you gotta be, like I said, responsible adult work, you know, all those things that, that my father taught me, like, you know, work hard, hard, nothing beats hard work. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Mm -hmm. All those things still ring true. Yeah, for all sure. These years later, and and um, if you treat everybody with kindness and open arms, you know that's what you'll get in return. So just try to, you know, look. Nobody's perfect. Um, everybody's got their flaws, but if you just keep a good attitude and get up every day and and have a great attitude and be happy that you woke up breathing, I think you know more good will happen than bad. 
Absolutely. I agree with that. Well, awesome. And then I also hear last thing though, before I let you go, is there a possible documentary on, was it either of warrant or your life that somebody wanted to make? Um, we, <laughs> there's no, there's no, if, if it was a documentary on my life, it'd be probably pretty boring. Um, we're talking to a really good friend. That's a big fan of the band and he's, he's actually in the musical instruments um, uh, industry. He's a president of a company that has written a treatment to do a documentary. And um, wow. we talked about it last year when the pandemic started and I ran it by everybody because they know him well. Anytime we go to Chicago, we go over to this guy's house for, he opens his house, we go over for dinner. He's just a, a tremendous friend of the band as well as a tremendous fan. And he's written a pretty cool treatment. So I think now that we're going to start to fire things up again, I talked to Eric about it a few weeks ago and we're going to, visit it and see if we start to fire up on a little documentary that maybe it'll be an hour, an hour and a half long. So it'll kind of put a cap on the whole warrant world and everybody can understand it from, from our, our perspective. That's awesome. I look forward to that. That's going to be really cool. Well, thank you so much. This has been a dream come true for me. Like I said, I've been a, a fan since I was a kid. So thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Anytime. Hope to see you at a show next time we're over in Phoenix. Yeah. Or I, like, I think I'm going to drive to this one in Minnesota. It just looks like so much fun. There's so many, oh, I, I've interviewed half the bands on the lineup. So I figured might as well come see them. Yeah. Let us know anything you need. We'll take care of you, Chuck. Okay. Thanks, Joey. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. Appreciate the team. Bye-bye. Well, that was extremely entertaining. I think one of the best interviews I've ever done. Certainly one of the most fun. So I don't think Joey has Instagram or Twitter uh, but you can follow the band Warrant on everything to keep up with tour dates and new releases and hopefully that documentary soon. So I'd love to catch them in Minnesota in September for that Rock Timber Festival with Sebastian Bach and Lit and a bunch of other great bands. I think that'd be a very fun show. Um, so thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate your support. And some of you share these episodes on social media. And I can't tell you how much that means to me. It really helps me out as well as helps out the guests. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. I don't want to get too woo-woo-y on here, but I've just been really happy lately and really enjoying doing this podcast, and I couldn't do it without people listening. So again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate you all. I hope you have a great day, and whatever you do, remember to shoot for the moon.